Hi, everyone. Great to be here. I heard there were a thousand of you. I'm not sure if you are. But it's fantastic to be here. It's, it's really a super cool experience to see this whole gamification stuff going on. I'm going to talk about today using serious play to understand complex business theories. So we've been working with different complex business games for eight years now. And I have a few cases that I'd like to share with you. Uh, but first, a little bit about us. So as was mentioned, we deliver these types of games. We do a lot of serious games. We do a lot of gear games for fun also. Uh, we have it delivered games primarily in Scandinavia for over 600,000 people. And we are now looking at expanding in Europe. More about that later. Now, I found this on Facebook the other day, and it made me laugh. Um, and why I am, I, I feel that this is perfect communication. And I'm gonna come back to this and explain why I've showed this, but you'll understand soon. Who is this on the picture? Anyone? Homer Simpson, well done. Where does Homer Simpson work? Power plant, very well, very well done. What is Homer Simpson's boss called? Who said Burns? All right, there you go. Oh, I missed you. Right. Mr. Burns. Now, why am I talking about Homer uh, Simpson and Mr. Burns? Well, in Mr. Burns' power plant, Mr. Burns has a number of strategic priorities. Often there are five of them. And he wants to reach these strategic priorities in order to be evil and earn money. Now, do you think Homer knows about these strategic priorities? Probably not, no. Communication there doesn't work. Homer doesn't care very much. However, uh, this topic of understanding strategic priorities, uh, that the top bosses know them, and other bosses and people lower down in the organization maybe don't, MIT Sloan, uh, that's MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, their business unit, Sloan, wanted to check whether or not people lower down in the organization understood strategic priorities or not. So. Uh, they went ahead and did this huge study with uh, 850 American corporations, 2,500 2, mid-managers, so not the people in the way bottom and not the people in the way top, but the big chunk in the middle. And they wanted to check how many of these managers know of the top strategic priorities. And of course, the people on the top have been communicating this through emails. Sorry, could I have the clock, please? So they have been communicating these strategic priorities through emails and town hall meetings and so forth. My question to you is, and I have the second Twix here, how many in percent of these 2,000 or 8,000, what was it now? 2,500 managers, how many percent of those knew zero? Not a single one could name them. 8.7, that's not right. Anyone else? 14, 16. 13, up, 14, up, up, 16, further up, 3-0, uh, further, further, come on, 80, no, lower, okay, I'm keeping this, it's 45, it's 45 percent, and Back to this, this is great communication because I know so much about avocado. When I buy avocado, I go in and I feel it, I you know, play around with it, I check every single one and then I eat it afterwards and it's good or it's bad. And you know what I mean? There, you have this relationship with avocado because that's an experience, right? And good communication is an experience. This was written by Wired magazine when they looked at something called active learning. And to describe active learning, they wrote this. Take 20 seconds to read it. When mastering an activity, there's no substitute for the interaction and feedback that comes from practice. Of course, everyone knows this here, and everyone recognizes this. This is called active learning, and the National Academy of Sciences in the USA, which is a big deal, they said this about active learning when looking at it seriously. They saw that failure rates among students plummeted by 30% when you have an active approach to learning instead of what I'm doing now, okay? 
So people really remember stuff from active learning. And games are active learning on steroids. So we design games for learning. Okay, I'm gonna give you two cases and then I'm gonna give you six tips on how to use this yourself so you don't have to you know, get a professional to do it for you. Case number one, we have a Scandinavian client, a huge uh, company that uh, works in, with shipping, and uh, they wanted to communicate to their employees, to their mid-managers, that it's really important with planning and attention to detail. And specifically, they wanted their managers to start using their systems and their tools more, because they weren't doing this. They said that if they start using systems and tools more, we will have much better planning and attention to detail, and we will, of course, earn much more money, and things will work much more smoothly. So they came with this challenge to us. And uh, we sat down and we looked at how to, uh, look at how to, how to solve this. And uh, we used uh, something that we call the spider or the spider web methodology for building a game. It's a pretty simple but very powerful way of building a game. You, put, you take an end goal, what you're supposed to achieve, of course, in any, in, in any game. You put it in the middle. And then around it, like a spider web, you go, there are different ways to get to this end goal. And everybody knows about these ways, but things happen, and you have to find information and kind of work your way to find which of these ways is the best to reach the end goal. Now, this is a little bit theoretical. Here's what it looked like. We said, OK, we did a big map of the world. We said the end goal is a spinning factory in Curitiba, Brazil, and you are playing a bunch of consultants that are supposed to help a company to procure, buy cotton in one of eight different markets and take that to uh, the spinning factory in Curitiba before a certain deadline and under a certain cost. So the brief is pretty simple, okay? What's very complicated, however, is the total information overload that we put in this, which is very similar to what the shipping uh, uh, company has. You have boat freight timetables, tons of them. Uh, you have uh, different disinformation that comes in, this guy that starts asking about the warehouse problems that is not really important. Route uh, t for table air cargo. You have uh, timetables for the manufacturing production in Curitiba, or you can only choose a certain ones of them. You have cotton purchasing facilities. You have world cotton prices, and this is total information overload. And so these, the groups start working on this. We're typically, we work in conferences, but also we do this in offices. And they, uh, they are given a, a computer tablet and all this information, and they're supposed to find the best way there. It's quite mathematical. We use tabs, so uh, we call this game Deadline. And uh, here you see uh, it comes in disinformation, special mission. Your purchasing manager, Jim, is on site in Brazil. He needs you to help with a short task. Uh, and the whole point is you're not supposed to help Jim because there's too much to think of, right? And you, they play this game, and all this disinformation comes in, and there's like these breaking news, trade wars, so they shut down this place, and one boat sinks, and an air airplane cargo terminal breaks down, and so tons of stuff happens. And it's a lot of fun. And it really, it really highlights how important it is to plan and uh, have attention to detail. What this client could do afterwards was that after this experience, which took one to two hours approximately, they could refer to this game all the time. If you use the systems, this won't work. If you use the system, it will work. And take help of all these tools. So it really helped them uh, understand better. And this game specifically, we have sold to, I think, more than 100, 150 times after that for similar uh, challenges in companies. That's case number one. Case number two, telecoms IT, a uh, very big company that came to us uh, to talk about something called value-based pricing. And this is a big challenge within sales, spe specifically in complex sales, where you have salespeople that are selling to customers complex products, but are not really looking at things from the customer's perspective. It's a big challenge, specifically when you have people that are really good at sales, that are really good at that are in top management, putting themselves into their customers' shoes and understanding their business, but the people under them are just holding their presentations and not really looking at things out of the correct perspective. You have the typical salesperson that comes back to the office and says, you know, we have to give them a better price because they, they're telling me I need a better price, and they're not looking at it out of the correct perspective. So they came to us and they asked, can you build a game that helps our managers and our senior salespeople to put themselves into the shoes of our clients, to really understand how they think? And in telecoms, we, uh, we looked at a methodology that's inspired by Monopoly, where we kind of have a risk versus reward thing. And everybody can relate to this because everybody's played Monopoly. You buy stuff, you, you have your cash, uh, you take a high risk sometimes maybe, 
but you know, if you buy too much, you're out of the game. So that's kind of the risk-reward uh, way of looking at things. And of course, this is the same for their clients. Business is like this. You take risks and you get rewards. So we took a kind of monopoly framework and then we applied it to telecoms. And this is a typical setup. You have top left corner, you have the bank, that's where all the money is. Top bottom corner, you have your cash, that's what you've earned. Top right corner are the vendors. They're the different IT and telecom um, companies that, that sell you, you are the client, so they're selling you what's called capacity. So they're building stuff for you. Uh, and then you have uh, what's called your capacity units, which is how well your infrastructure works, how well you can deliver IT. And of course, if you choose a low quality vendor, might be cheap, but that low quality vendor might give you poor capacity units. Okay, so they're cheap, but you get, and so maybe you save money, but then you get poor capacity units. And that has consequences. And we made a game out of these consequences so that they would play the clients. And it worked like this. There are four rounds in the game. Each round consists of the following. First of all, introduction, goals for the round and information about the four vendors. So you get tons of information about what quality the vendors have, if they're close to collapsing, you know, if, if they've had a bad track record, if they've had uh, problems with, um, I don't know, uh, government or anything. You have all that background information. You can sit down and discuss and look at it. You have an investment phase where you choose who to buy from and how. So either you, you, know, you can pay everything up front or you pay in installments and so forth, so you can choose a lot about that. Events, important micro and macro events that might affect you, like, I don't know, government default or whatever happens out there. Uh, things like uh, changing to 4G in the mobile industry, so that, that has effects. Financial results, information on results and collection of profits, and you should maximize cash over time. Uh, and then a market summary, which is reflections on the past and future trends. And all this kind of is the reality of their clients uh, in a usual framework. Uh, but you are supposed to not play the client, so you're supposed to understand this, and there, thereby you put yourself in the client's shoes. Um, we use our tabs here all the time that makes, you know, it changes things and it helps them input their answers and we can track what people are answering so that top management sees that people have understood things or not. And of course, as you understand, this game is the typical a game where you have, on the one hand, quality versus what it costs, cash versus the risk you take, and then we put a little element of luck inside, which makes it more fun. So um, that was, uh, uh, they, they learned a lot from this, and uh, they have been looking at rolling it out so that people in other organizations can learn the same thing. Part three. Uh, these games take us approximately, when we do bespoke games, they take us approximately two to three hundred hours to build. It's a lot of work. Uh, that means also that we don't build very many of these, actually. We, 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 we do more of simpler stuff. So um, here are six tips on how you can achieve maybe not the full results, but similar things uh, by doing simple, simple things uh, for your employees. Tip number one. Uh, cases are great, but you need dilemmas. What do I mean by this? Well, instead of building a game around how your client uh, uh, makes decisions in a monopoly type setting, you can actually pretty well just design a case. Just write a case where you explain what the dilemma the, ca the, the client is, is, um, is pondering right now and what decisions that the client is trying to make. Uh, of course, it doesn't go all the way as, as in a game, but it is actually quite similar. You can get a lot of good discussion, for instance, among salespeople around dilemmas. The important thing is, when you design a game, is that it needs to be a dilemma. It needs to be difficult to know. It, it needs to make you think. So in, you, you want to have people around the table discussing and have different views, different opinions on things. So just make a case, have your employees try out the case. That's a great form of communication, uh, but you need to make it a dilemma. Number two. Go digital to avoid post-it stress. Post-it stress is what we call when you've had like a conference or a meeting and afterwards you have these uh, thousand post-it notes that you're supposed to collect and kind of gather the data around. Just to avoid that, use digital tools such as, for instance, email or maybe Twitter. We have this that we call ViewPipe, which is a closed Twitter uh, application. Number three, 
if you can't make a game, mix in a game, this is actually very effective. One of the good things with a game is that it's an icebreaker and it makes people talk. And so, for instance, what you see here is a game board that we use where when people are on the black boxes, they discuss cases. But where they're on the, the gray ones, they just play a normal trivia game that just makes them you know, have fun and, and, and do some high fives and, and just talk and laugh. And it's great to just mix it up. If you can't mix it in, just mix it up. Number four. This is great, we use this all the time. Find a model, like on the internet. This is what's called journey, journey mapping. I don't really have time to explain it, but it's about what emotions that a salesperson has or a buyer has when, when purchasing something. We take these models and then we just remove the content and then uh, we say, you know, study the one with content and then we remove that and here's a blank one and just fill it in by yourself. It's not, it's not exactly gamification, but it's a really good exercise. Uh, and it, it's similar to games. Number five, use quizzes as we saw before uh, from the presentation that was really interesting with all the, uh, the voting that we did. Uh, thumbs up for that, I think. Uh, quizzes are fantastic. I mean, you go f a long way with just simple quizzes. And then number six, something that we really like, go outside. You know, walk and talk. Put a, have a quiz, go out and walk, uh, see the nature, find uh, stuff on walls, uh, mix it up with a form of team building activity and workshop at the same time. It's a great way to get some air and, and have fun with your colleagues and break the ice. That's it. Uh, I just wanted to say before I end uh, the speech that we have a stand out there and then to the right. We are, as I said in the beginning, we are looking to expand in Europe. Uh, we are uh, giving exclusive area rights uh, of what we do to people in large cities across Europe. And if you help us find someone, we offer a substantial bonus. So... Um, that's it. Thank you. Alexis. Lights on, please.